I would like, if you don't mind, beloved brothers and sisters, just to see if I can just read these verses once again that I've read thus far, once again from Daniel uh, chapter 7, and the verse is verse 7 again. Just to, to grasp it, and I also uh, uh, would like to emphasize this for all of us uh, uh, once again. Verse 7 again I'm reading. Daniel 7 and verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like unto the eyes of a man, and mouths speaking great things. I beheld till the horns or the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. And I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their life were prolonged, for a season and time. Verse 13 tells us, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, Ben Adam in Hebrew, come with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And so, beloved brothers and sisters, I have just read uh, Daniel chapter 7, and verses uh, uh, um, 7 all the way to verse uh, 14. Let's just remember where we are. We have mentioned in our previous uh, study of the book of Daniel that Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 really go the long one with another. In, Jan in Daniel chapter 2, we saw Nebuchadnezzar having a dream which he needed someone to interpret for him, and Daniel was used by the Lord to give the interpretation of the image, the dream of the image, with the four different metals, gold, silver, uh, brass, and iron. And then here in Daniel chapter 7, we see this time Daniel having not so much a dream, but really visions. And it is an angel that helped Daniel to understand this image or these uh, visions that he sees now in this uh, seventh chapter. Now these two uh, chapters, chapter 2 and chapter 7, goes very well along with Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 17. In our study of Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 17, we have learned of the two beasts in Revelation chapter 13, one that rise out of the sea and the other one rise out of the land, of the earth. 
These two beasts, along with Satan himself, which will, was, was cast down to this, to this earth, together they are forming the counterfeit Godhead, the false Godhead. Satan representing the false God, the Father, the first beast representing the false God, the Son, and the second beast representing the false God, the Holy Spirit, the counterfeit Godhead. So here, beloved brothers and sisters, in this seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, Daniel received this vision from God, and God looking down upon the times of the Gentiles, and he sees them from a divine perspective. What does he see? He sees the times of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles will rule over Israel and over all the nations of the world, he sees them as a beasts, as animals, in an animal a, a form, a, a very vicious, very evil, very, a, 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 you might say, unhumane, the way that they have treated both Israel and the nations of the world. And then on the other hand, when Nebuchadnezzar saw the vision of the times of the Gentiles in the vision of the image, he saw it from a human perspective great and powerful, all sort of metals, gold and silver and, and bronze and iron. From a human perspective, men look at these kingdoms, the empires of this world, as if they are so great. And yet from God's perspective, looking down on these uh, empires, representing the long period of the times of the Gentile, God sees them from an animal animal a view from a beastly, in a beastly a view. So Daniel chapter 7 verses 1 to 3, Daniel had a dream and visions which he wrote and placed it for us in this canon. Daniel chapter 7 verses 4 to 8 where we are right now, we see the content of this vision which he saw, the visions which he saw, which really represent before us these four beasts. These Four beasts representing the uh, four empires that will rise up during the times of the Gentile where the people of Israel are taken away from the land and they, because of disobedience, lost the rule and the kingdom and they, God have removed himself from being in the city of Yerushalayim. And here he went, you might say, his glory was taken to heaven. And he's called oftentimes the God of heaven during these days of the times of the Gentiles. Yet, he is the same God of Israel who is watching over the affairs of his own earthly people, who is always and and he is going to fulfill his plan in restoring the people of Israel back to himself. We who are part of the assembly, the church today, find ourselves during the times of the Gentiles, but we are part of the heavenly company, the church, the ecclesia, the assembly that belong to the Lord Jesus Christ in glory. And so we have the Babylonian Empire represented in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 4, like a lion that had two wings. Then we have the Medo-Persian Empire, which is in Daniel 7 and verse 5, and it's seen there as a bear that is a side where one side is higher than the other side, and in his mouth he has three as it says here in verse 5, he has three ribs. And the Middle Persians have ultimately took over other nations uh, represented by these ribs. And the Middle Persian Empire is represented here as the bear, one like unto a bear. Then we read in verse 6, and we saw that Daniel saw another animal, another beast like a leopard that had upon himself four wings and four heads. This, um, this Grecian empire uh, began with Alexander the Great, which ended up 
when the Alexander the Great have died, the four heads represent the four uh, generals that took over the Grecian Empire and ruled over the Grecian Empire until the end of the Grecian Empire, when the Roman Empire came to its fruition. And so we have read in verse 7, that's where we are now, Daniel 7 and verse 7, and we have spoken about the, I saw in the night, night vision, and behold, there was a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with its feet, the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Notice the ten horns that he had, the beast had, and that is uh, speaking to us of now of the Roman Empire. Now, beloved brothers and sisters, you notice that in chapter 4, in ch uh, I'm sorry, in chapter 7, verse 4, verse 5, and verse 6, we have this expression uh, that he was a, so a beast like a lion in verse 4, a beast like a bear, and a beast like a leopard. But when it comes to verses 7 and 8, about this beast, uh, uh, um, um, Daniel cannot even describe it. It's not like a lion, and it's not like a bear, and it's not like a leopard. In fact, Daniel tells us that he saw in verse 7, that this beast was diverse from all the other beasts which were before it. Why? Because it looks terrible. And the description that Daniel gives us of this fourth empire is a terrible description. It was a dreadful and a terrible beast. This beast was exceedingly strong in verse 7. It had a great iron teeth. If you remember, when we have studied Daniel chapter 2, that the fourth kingdom that in the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, that the fourth, uh, 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 the fourth uh, kingdom, namely the Roman Empire in the image, had ten toes, and some of that was iron and some of it was clay. And the two feet made out of iron. If you remember, we have seen it in that image. Now that representing the strength of the a Roman Empire and these uh, iron teeth speaks of biting strongly and devouring. And that is speaking to us about the Roman Empire. And notice this, that as we are reading these verses, Daniel receives information about the Roman Empire, but he takes us all the way to even the final days of the Roman Empire because he continues and he says that it, it had an a, a iron teeth, it devoured, it broke in pieces, and he stamped the residue. He was violent in stamping upon anyone that remains, any nation, any people completely devouring, really, you might say, with very forceful way. And then it says that when he, stamp, when he stamped the residue with his feet, with the feet of it, it, was, it said that it was diverse from all the other beasts. But notice it says about this fourth beast, it had ten horns. Now these ten horns, in the image, representing the ten toes. This is the final... A, a, a empire of the Romans. It was a very, it was an imperial a, empire, and it will come to be in a future day, after the rapture of the church and the a, tribulation days, that represent the ten kings. Speaking of the ten kingdoms, that the world will be divided into. Uh, during the times of the seven year of the tribulation period. Notice it says here in these next verse, verse 8, I consider the horns. Which horns? These ten horns of which we read in verse 7. The ten horns 
in, re, in verse 7, on the head of this animal, on the head of this beast, when Daniel considered these ten horns, verse 8, and behold, he says, there came up among them another little horn. In other words, what we really learn, beloved brothers and sisters, from verse 8 of Daniel chapter 7, that a, a, in addition to the ten, a, a ten horns, which represent the ten toes in the image in chapter 2, which representing ten kings in that uh, revived Roman Empire in the future day, there will rise up another little horn that will be the eleventh one. Now, what this eleventh one will do, according to verse 8, this little horn, notice what he will do, because now we have ten plus one, eleven. That little horn is none else but the counterfeit Messiah, the Antichrist of which of whom we read in Revelation chapter 13. I'll read it to you in a moment. It says here that this little horn uh, before whom were three of the first horn plucked up. In other words, he destroyed three of the kings that uh, were uh, out of the ten. In other words, there will remain now seven plus this little horn horn and he will be the one who will ultimately rule over all all in the future day the all the other seven uh, um, uh, horns representing the uh, kings that will remain they will all be subdued to him notice that he said he will uh, uh, before whom there were three of the first horn plucked up by the roots he will destroy them and take over and then it says, And behold, in this horn there were eyes like the eyes of men, and a mouth that speaking great things. Now this one, beloved brothers and sisters, this final beast that is diverse from all the others, is none else but the false Messiah, the counterfeit Messiah, of whom we read in the book of Revelation, especially a Revelation chapter 13. If you don't mind, turn with me for a moment to Revelation chapter 13. And there you will notice, beloved brothers and sisters, that in this 13th chapter, which we have already covered in our study on the book of Revelation, in chapter 13, we are in the, in the, during the tribulation period. To, rem to remind you, beloved brothers and sisters, we have already learned that the church will be raptured out of here before the tribulation will begin. Why? Simply because the tribulation was not allotted for the church. Whenever you read about the tribulation period, it is always in connection with the nation of Israel and with this world. The assembly, the church, the ecclesia is a heavenly company. The church will be raptured out of here and then the tribulation period will begin as we read it from Revelation chapter 6 all the way to Revelation chapter 19 to the second coming of the Messiah. And here notice in Revelation chapter 13 we read in verse 1, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast. Notice again, God looking and the rulers of this world as beasts that rising out of the sea, out of the nations. And out, notice that, and up, uh, rise up out of the sea, and notice having seven heads and ten horns. Again, remember, that beast, having now in Revelation 13, seven heads and ten horns, and the ten horn representing the ten kings. And the seven uh, heads is really the same out of the ten. Three of them he will subdue and eight and seven will remain and he will be the eighth one. And then it says, And upon his horn were ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the, the feet of a bear, and his mouth was as the mouth of the lion. Notice what happened here. The same names of the leopard 
the bear and the lion that is mentioned in Daniel 7, which were the previous empires, now that fourth empire, you might say, took over all of these empires, and he had, you might say, some of the character of the Babylonian, some of the character of the Medo-Persian, some of the character of the Grecian, but he was the final beast that rose out from the sea, from the nations. And then we read, and the, and the dragon gave him his power and his seed and great authority. Let's jump to verse 5, uh, here in uh, Revelation 13 and verse 5, it says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue for 40 and 2 months. This is the three and a half years, especially the second half of the tribulation period. For three and a half years, beloved brothers and sisters, this beast, this antichrist, uh, will be a um, 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 uh, speaking against God and blaspheming the name of God. Now, I just want to mention here that in Revelation chapter 13, we have two beasts. One of them that rise out of the sea and the other one rise out of the earth, out of the land. And some view that the Antichrist is really the second beast rather than the first beast. I personally understand from the scripture that it is the Antichrist and the false prophet are represented by the first beast is the Antichrist, the counterfeit Messiah, and the second beast representing the false a prophet. And together with Satan, they're forming the, the counterfeit a Godhead, the false Godhead. And so back to our chapter, in chapter 7 of Daniel, and verse this time, we're in verse 8, and notice what this beast does. He is literally uh, plucking out three by the root of these horns, three kings. Also, what does he do? He says he has eyes like the eyes of a man, and uh, he speak, mouth that is speaking great things. When you read of these great things, it's not that he's speaking some wonderful words. No, we read it in uh, Revelation 13 that he's blaspheming the name of the God of creation. He's blaspheming the name of the God of heaven. He's really blaspheming the name of our Lord Yeshua, Jesus, uh, the Messiah. And so now, beloved brothers and sisters, we have seen in Daniel 7 verses 4 to 8, we have seen these four beasts. The one representing Babylon, like a lion. The one representing the Middle Persian, like a bear. The one representing the Grecian Empire, like a leopard. And the one that representing the Roman Empire, which was an imperial empire, this is represented by the fourth beast that is not even a, have a clear description, but as Daniel called him, he was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. So what we really see here, that in Daniel 7, we have additional information that Daniel 2 did not give us. In the image... We saw the gold, the silver, the, the, the bronze, and the iron. But in chapter 7, we receive additional information, and it really takes us all the way to the last days in which ultimately all the empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, all these empires all together, will finally be ultimately put to an end because in the next verses, beloved brothers and sisters, in the vision that Daniel sees in chapter 7, in verses 9 all the way to verse 14, now we see in these uh, beautiful verses, verses uh, 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 9 to 14, we see the vision that Daniel sees in heaven of the coming of the Son of Man in his second coming. See, Daniel now sees 
the Messiah, that is coming at the end of the tribulation period, when he will come from heaven, from glory, to judge this world in righteousness. So there is a scene of judgment here in verses 9 to verse 14. Just follow me on these verses. First of all, in verse 9, Daniel sees throne placed down. And what does he see? He see the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne. We read in verse 9, And I beheld until the thrones were cast down. In the King James, he says, cast down, but in the Aramaic language, it's not that they are cast down, but they are set, they are being placed in order. Here we see that thrones are being placed in order, are set down, and who does Daniel see in this vision? In Daniel 7 and verse 9 on, he sees the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is none else but God the Father. Elohim Ha'aba. Here we see God is there. Notice he did sit, sitting on his throne. In a sense, what we do see here, beloved brothers and sisters, we see here that God who is in control, the creator of the universe, the one who is the ancient of days. When you read the word ancient of days, it doesn't speak about God as being old, because God is not getting old. God is eternal. From eternity to eternity, thou art God. We see the everlasting God. And in the context of our chapter, we see that he is presented here before us as God, the Father, that is sitting on his throne. And you notice what happened. It's so beautiful to see that because it's fascinating to see that as he's sitting on this on this throne called the Ancient of Days, in Hebrew it's called Atik Yamim, Atik Hayamim. He's ancient, he's eternal, and he's ancient of days. There's no end to his self-existence, no beginning and no end. He's eternal. And so he's sitting on the throne that have been set down. And then notice what we find out, certain things about uh, describing this person, this God, uh, the Father, the Ancient of Days. It says that his garment was white as snow. Speak about his purity. God is holy. God is pure. You remember what we read in 1 John chapter 1? God is light and in him there is no darkness. In the book of Leviticus, God said to our people of all the people of Israel, Be ye holy, Kadosh, for I am holy. This, the white a, a, a garment, a white as snow, representing that he is pure, undefiled, separate from sinners. That's the God who is called the Ancient of Days. Amazing to think about this description. Secondly, we read about him. He's not only that his garment was white as snow, his hair and his head was like the pure wool. That speaks of his purity as well, but also of his wisdom. You know, God is wise. Nothing is escaping God. He is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient. He is everywhere. He is all-powerful. And he sees all things. He is a wise God. Daniel sees in this vision, after he saw the vision of the four beasts representing the four empires during the times of the Gentiles, he is now directed to heaven. And what does he see? He see the Ancient of Days, sitting on his throne, and he's, he's receiving the description of him. His garment white as snow, his hair, the hair of his head was pure wool, speaks of purity and speaks of 
uh, of the fact of wisdom. Then he says the, the throne, notice it says that his throne was like a fiery flame. That speaks of the fact that God is glorious, but also God is a, a God who will judge righteously. In scripture, oftentimes fire represents on one hand his glory, the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah in Hebrew, but also the fact that he will judge sin. He is a righteous judge who judge sin. And so Daniel sees this ancient of days in his vision. And also another thing he, we read about him, that notice it says here that, he's, that not only that his throne was like a fiery flame, but also his wills, this is the wheels of the throne, is not as, as burning fire. And you know, when you think about wheels, we think about when you have a chair, a seat that's sitting on a wheel, that means that he is not stationary only in one place. He's everywhere. He's at all places, at all time. He's a moving from place to place. He's not limited to one locality. See, Satan, who wanted to be like God, he cannot be everywhere at the same time. He's merely an, a fallen angel. But the ancient of days, the Atik Hayamim, he is the one that is garment white as snow, his hair of his head was pure wool, he's thrown like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. He is everywhere. He can move from place to place. He's in everywhere at the same time, not limited in where he can be at all time. And so Daniel sees this in verse 9. And uh, notice that if you don't mind, if to turn with me to a few verses in the book of Psalms, just turn with me to the Psalms. And I just want to make reference to some of the Psalms, the fact that God is a ruler. God is a king. God is not limited to any uh, anyone. He is in charge of all the affairs of this world. Notice in, in Psalm 97, we read, Psalm 97, verse 1, The Lord reigneth. In Hebrew it says, Adonai Malach, Adonai Melech. Yehovah Melech, he is a king. The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Here's the word throne again. Verse 3, a fire goes before him and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightning enlightened the world. The earth saw and trembled. Verse 5, the hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. God is reigning. He is ruling. If you go back for a moment to, to the Psalm 93 and verse 1, there we read again, verse 1, the Lord reigneth. Adonai Melech, Adonai Malach, God is a king. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he has girded himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. Fascinating verses, beloved brothers and sisters. Look at another verse in Psalm 96 and verse 10. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. Adonai Malach, Adonai Melech, he's king. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. And then one more verse in Psalm 99 and verse 1. Again, the psalmist of Israel continue to sing of this God, of this Lord, of this King. Verse 1 of Psalm 99, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubim. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is reigning. God is in control over the affairs of this world, beloved brothers and sisters. 
and Daniel in his in his visions in Daniel chapter 7 he's taken up after he saw that vision of the four beasts and especially the fourth one which was terrible he is now directed to glory to heaven and he see an amazing sight thrones are a set and the ancient of day of day sitting there and he is represented by his garment his hair his throne his his wheels and notice it says in verse 10 of our chapter Daniel chapter uh, 7 and verse 10 in verse 10 we see that the holy God is issuing judgment judgment is coming beloved brothers and sisters God will judge this world in righteousness God will judge this world one day in righteousness. He is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but the day is coming when God will ultimately judge this world in righteousness. And those that refuse to accept the Messiah, Yeshua, the only way of salvation, will be judged. Even this earth, specifically at the end of the tribulation period, the Lord will judge this world in righteousness. I'm reminded of the verse that the Apostle Shaul Paul uh, placed for us in the canon of Scripture, in Acts chapter 17, where the Apostle Paul is, uh, is appealing to the people in Athens. And he said to them, listen, he said, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. This is Acts 17 and verse 22. And he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. You are too religious. And then he continue and he tell them about the true and living God. And he said, God, verse 24, was made a world in, and all things were in, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. He dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with man's hand, as though he need anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And then notice what he says in verse 28. I'm just jumping over some of the verses. For in him we live and move and have our being, he's saying to the the people at, uh, at, uh, at Athens. But then notice what he says in verse 30. The time... Of his of this ignorant God had winked it. But now he commandeth every man everywhere, all men everywhere to repent. Why? Why? He says in verse 31 of Acts chapter 17, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. Whereof, as it said, he continued to say, how he will judge? He said, by that man whom he has ordained. And that man is the son of man, Ben Adam, our Lord Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. He will judge this world by that man whom he ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, in that he has raised him from the dead. And beloved brothers and sisters, What we see in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel sees a vision of the, uh, in heaven, he sees uh, the ancient of days, this is God the Father, he is represented here with his holiness, his purity, he's all seeing, he's all knowing, he's all powerful, then he is not limited to one locality. And then notice in verse 10, I am now in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 10. In verse 10, we see that he is issuing judgment that will one day will come, will fall upon the face of this world. In a sense, we are entering into the courtroom, the courtroom of the presence of God. And so we read in verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. God is issuing the fire stream of his righteous indignation against sin. Those that rejected the Messiah who gave himself for the sin of this world, they will ultimately be judged. The empires, 
the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Grecians, and Romans, and the revived Roman Empire, which is including the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan himself, will ultimately be judged when God is pronouncing his judgment specifically in the context at the second coming of the Messiah. We do read in verse 10, thousands, thousands ministered unto him. This is angelic beings. Uh, beings are falling before him and serving him and worshiping him and, and, and acknowledging that he is that ancient of days, ready to execute judgment. We continue to read, notice in verse 10, it says here, and it says here, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him, and judgment was set, and the books were open. Doesn't it remind us of, that, of Revelation, where we studied together in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, when uh, chapter 5, when John, Yohanan, was weeping, because there was no one able to open the book and to look even thereon, because nobody was worthy. All have sinned. And then the angel told him, John, weep not, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He has prevailed. The seed of Jesse, he had prevailed. And then it is the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, who died for our sins and finished the work of redemption. And he's the only one who is qualified to execute this judgment and to take over the world that have turned away from him. To restore the kingdom that was taken away from the people of Israel because of Israel's violation and disobedience. And the times of the Gentiles will come to an end when Israel is restored and the Messianic kingdom will be established. Notice what we read here in these next verses. Judgment was set in verse, 11, verse 10, and the book, books were opened. The court is in session. Judgment is ready to be executed. But notice now what we find in the next verses. In verse 11, Daniel beheld the destruction of the final fourth beast, the Antichrist, of the final uh, uh, portion of the, of the empire, the revived Roman Empire. We read, notice that in this verse 11, very interesting. Notice what we read in verse 11, And I beheld, then because of the voice of the great, not of the great words which the horn spake. Remember, if you go back for a moment to verse 8, that 11th horn that rose up out of the, over and above the 10 horns that were on that beast, that amazing, undescript, undescriptive a beast which is representing the Roman Empire at its final stage. Ten horns, ten kings. That eleventh king, that eleventh horn, what happened? He spake, notice his mouth speaking great things. This is the, the, the words of blasphemy against God. And even now we learn that God will ultimately make an end to the final revived Roman Empire, and specifically, he will make an end of the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan himself. And so you notice that. In verse 11, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. Then we read, And I beheld even until the beast was slain. Ultimately, that beast, that Antichrist, counterfeit Mashiach, false Messiah, he will ultimately be, be slain. He will be slain, notice, and his body will be destroyed and given to the burning fire. Ultimately, beloved brothers and sisters, God will judge the Antichrist as well as the false prophet and also Satan himself. 
Now, if you go with me once again, please, to Revelation, I want you to read with me Revelation chapter 13 one more time. And then notice it, Revelation chapter 13. And then we read in verse 5. And there was given unto him mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue for 42 months. 42 months is exactly three and a half years. These 42 months is the second half of the seven years of the tribulation period. In other words, the Antichrist will will claim to be God in the middle of the tribulation period. He will, as we have studied already in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that he will claim to be God. He will ask everyone to worship him. He will speak against the true and living God. He will want to take the place of the Messiah. That's why he's called Antichrist. Not only that he's against Christ, but he's a counterfeit Messiah. You see, both beasts of Revelation chapter 13 are Antichrist. Both of them are against the Messiah. But one of them is a counterfeit, looks or seek to take the place of Yeshua, the Messiah. And that's the one of whom we read here in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 11 and Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5. Now, if you turn to Revelation, uh, there in chapter 19, we read what happened to him at the end when God will judge him. Revelation chapter 19, at the second coming of the Messiah, we read, notice what we read, at the end of the 19th chapter, and the beast, verse 20, was taken with him and the false prophets with him that wrought miracles before him, which were which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worship his image, these, listen to these beloved brothers and sisters, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Notice that? They were cast into the lake of fire. They eventually was destroyed by God himself. And listen to this, back to our Chapter Daniel chapter 7 and verse 11. And I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld until the beast was slain and his body destroyed and was given to the burning fire. And then verse 12 says, as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away yet their life were prolonged for a season and a time. In other words, you remember there were four beasts, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, and then the one that could not be described. The remaining three beasts that rep- representing the Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, they, will, they were remaining, but they no longer had an empire status any longer. They continue on to be, you might say, to live, but they are no longer were an empire because the fourth and final Roman Empire uh, began its course. So every empire came to an end, and here we see the final empire, the Roman Empire, now ultimately and the, the final king is ultimately slain and was cast, was given to the flaming fire, while the, uh, 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 Daniel described to us the fact that the others remain until ultimately they were destroyed as well. Now, with the little time that we have left, I just want to read verses 13 and 14 so we can kind of conclude with that dream that uh, Daniel has seen in chapter 7. Now, Daniel saw a scene in heaven. God the Father sitting on a throne. Thousands upon thousands, 10,000 upon 10,000 angels are there before him. And what does he continue to see? Beautiful to see that now he sees the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus himself. 
Now remember, he sees him now not at his first coming. He sees him at the end of the times of the Gentiles, after he had already died and he was buried and he rose again. He was the Lamb of God that took upon himself the sin of this world. He lived a perfect life. He died a substitutionary death. He rose in order to provide justification for all who believe in him. He was ascended to heaven and God said to him, sit down at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Well, now the time has come that Yeshua, the Messiah's enemies, will become his footstool and the judgment will take place. And so verses 13 and 14, Daniel sees the Son of Man, the Messiah, at his second coming. You notice what we read in verse 13. I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man. In Hebrew, Ben Ha'adam. This is a messianic title. This is the name that the Lord called himself throughout his earthly ministry, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. The, the foxes have holes, the birds of the earth have nests, but the Son of Man, Ben Adam, has nowhere to lay his head. This is a messianic title of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And so we read one like unto the Son of Man, notice now, come with the clouds of heaven, and came, notice, to the ancient of days. Here is the Lord, as man, the God the Son, now as man, coming before the ancient of days, God the Father. And they brought him near before him. Here we see the ancient of days is sitting on the throne, and the Son of Man, Ben Adam, the Mashiach, the Messiah, is coming, and is before the ancient of days, before God the Father, as man. As men, beloved brothers and sisters. And you notice what happened? He is now coming. Notice it says he's coming with the clouds of heaven. The word for clouds of heaven represents the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah, the manifestation of the glory of God when he is coming now at his second coming. And so we read in verse 14, and this is the end for us for today in this ministry meeting. And there was given unto him, notice what there was given unto him, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. Here is the Messiah coming at his second coming. And he's coming to rule and to reign no longer Babylon, no longer Medo-Persia, no longer Greece, no longer Rome. No longer the Antichrist, no longer the, the false prophet, no longer Satan himself. But here the Mashiach, the Messiah, is coming in glory. Notice it says here, he's coming, uh, he's coming in the cloud with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient of day, and they brought him before him, and there was given. Notice God is given to him, God the Father. He's handing to this man, God the Son, in his humanity as man. And now he received this world for himself. No longer any other kingdom and any other nation. It says here in verse 14, a kingdom and a people and nation and languages should serve him. And notice when it's come to his dominion, verse 14, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Beloved brothers and sisters, all other kingdoms, empires were destroyed by him. But here the Messiah is coming, and he is coming to take his rightful place here in this world. The Apostle John in the book of Revelation, in chapter 1, he described it in this way. In verse 7, he says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. 
and they also which pierced him, and all kinders of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. Revelation 1 and verse 7. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, we read, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he does judge, and he makes war. In other words, the second coming of the Messiah, beloved brothers and sisters, is described before us at the end of the vision that of the four beasts that uh, Daniel has seen uh, by the divine order that God had given unto him. And he is called, beloved brothers and sisters, the Son of Man. God the Father gave to the Mashiach, to the Messiah Yeshua, he gave him dominion and glory and kingdom. His dominion is everlasting. His kingdom is not going to pass away. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. And he will rule and reign in righteousness for 1,000 years. Israel, as a nation, will finally acknowledge that he was the Mashiach. And he will gather the nation of Israel from all the four corners of the earth. And he will fulfill the promise that he made to his earthly people Israel, that they will be blessed as he had promised uh, to the nation of Israel. We who are part of the assembly, the ecclesia, we will come with him from heaven. And we will rule and reign with him over this earth. But his dominion, will never have an end. What a wonderful promise we have in the Word of God. And so, beloved brothers and sisters, that is what we conclude here with this study of Daniel chapter 7 and verse 14. I'm going to close with this, the uh, uh, Psalm 2 and verse 4 to 9. And I'm just reading this for our benefit. Psalm 2 verses 4 to 9. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vax them in his sore displeasure. And he, God will say, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare a decree, the Lord said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. They shall, uh, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. God found delight in his beloved son who became a man in order to provide redemption and finally now at his second coming he will come to rule and to reign over Israel and over all the nations of the world. We can say hallelujah to this wonderful future that is awaiting us. Well, we will stop here with this verse 14, because from verse 15 to the end of the chapter, Daniel now received the interpretation of this vision that he received directly from the Lord, from the angel that will help him to understand this vision of the four beasts. And for this, we will uh, wait until we will get into the next meeting, next Friday night Bible class. So we will close in prayer. We will let those that are with us over uh, YouTube and Facebook uh, will say shalom to you all after we pray. And then those of you that are on Zoom with us, please remain for some statements and questions and answers for a few minutes after this meeting is closed. And so Abba Father, we thank you for the beautiful day that is awaiting when the Messiah will return at his second coming. The son of man, Ben HaAdam, the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer who will come to take his rightful place here in this world. Bless what had been shared tonight. We commit ourselves to thee, Abba Father, for the remaining of this evening, for we ask it 
In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Just one moment, please, dear brothers and sisters. Well, shalom, everyone. God bless you. Uh, uh, it was good to have you with us for this session tonight.